Well, I hope some of you guys are still with me. <laughs> You're experiencing some technical difficulties here at Thunder Mesa Studio. Hi, yes, we're back. We're going to try this one more time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, um, it was locked in uh, uh, portrait mode, and uh, I couldn't get it out because, you know, old guys with technology, right? All right. There we go. Well, you know, I appreciate you guys hanging with me there. <laughs> so I had it all set up, you know, I had the live stream all set. It was all scheduled. It's like, I got this all figured out now. And it's locked in portrait mode. I'm not doing a TikTok video. You really don't want to see me do a TikTok video. Oh, hello from Texas. Yes, help. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Glad you could join us. What time is it down under? Hi, Norman. Gerald, Chris, how you doing? Daniel, hello. Nice to see you guys. You got to keep in mind there's like, a, there's like an eight second delay between when you type something in and when I see it down here in the chat that's pretty standard for live broadcasts you're working as a on a building as we speak lakota what are you working on <laughs> welcome to excursion special yes uh hello from connecticut i'm so glad uh you guys could join me just uh completely uh uh ignore that previous live stream so, you know, I'm just sitting here. It's a chilly fall evening up here in Jerome. Chilly. It's like 68. Uh, <laughs> getting out some of the Halloween decor and so on. Oh, uh, Jason Jensen is in the house. Hi, Jason. Thanks for joining us, man. Mm. Oh, the same station you sent me a picture of. Right. Right on. Cool. This previous stream is already forgotten. It was pretty forgettable. It really was. So uh, I've gathered you all here today. This is the uh, the monthly live stream from Thunder Mesa Studio. And I want to talk a little bit about some uh, favorite tools um, uh, that I like to use and maybe some techniques too. And you guys can share some of your, your favorite tools if you want to. And we can have a nice little uh, chat about that. Um, and of course, any questions you have along the way, uh, you know, I'd be happy to answer to the best of my ability, which, you know, tonight, who knows? <laughs> who knows where my ability is at tonight? <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's great to have you all here. I really appreciate you guys, appreciate you guys spent some time with me on a, uh, what is it, Wednesday night, um, you know, taking time out of your busy lives is the sound okay is the picture okay i always have to ask that because um we never know all right first of all um i had a question before i got here tonight from lindley i don't know if he's with us uh, here on, on youtube but he asked me um how do you clean your one two three blocks and for those of you who don't know, these are one, two, three blocks, and they're used in machining and uh, and engineering stuff like that. Uh, and they're called one, two, three blocks because they are one inch this way, and two inches this way, and three inches uh, this way. And they're very, very handy, especially if you have a pair of them like this. Uh, for lining things up and keeping them square and i use them for weights and everything else but as lindley pointed out they get paint on them and they get uh, uh, ca on them and how do you get that off well i'll be honest i've never cleaned these <laughs> so um i'm guessing uh, probably the best way to clean them now that i look at it, there's little 
glue boogers on here, which of course what will happen is over time that will make them less square if they have, you know, things on them, glue, so glue spots and stuff. Um, I would get a, a scotch bright pad, a really low uh, abrasive scotch bright pad from my hardware store and uh, just clean them off that way. And then use a little um, machine oil, a little three-in-one oil. Wipe it on with a clean cotton cloth and let them dry completely before you go using them on models because that oil will come off on your models. When you get them, when you first buy these, they're a little oily. Uh, so you got to kind of wipe that off. But that's it. Clean them with a Scotch-Brite and, uh, uh, you know, oil them up. And they should uh, not rust because they will rust if, if they're left out in the uh, damp conditions, which we don't have to worry about here much in Arizona. Your one, two, three blocks are covered in grease. And they're still waiting to be cleaned. Yeah. I, I got to admit, I hadn't even really thought of it <laughs> until Lindley asked me that. <laughs> Howdy, Tim. Howdy, John, Gerald, Greg, Carrie. Nice to see all of you here tonight. Um, still working on the old uh, uh, gruesome gulch. I've got, what's today? The 19th? I've got 10 days to wrap that up. It's not going to be finished. And spoiler alert. Yeah, I set out to do it in four months, and uh, <clears throat> I learned that, uh, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Not with the other responsibilities and things that I have. I couldn't get it done in four months. It's, it's about 80% of the way there. So this week, I want to get the fascia on it and uh, get that painted so it looks done from the front. Uh, I've got another structure that I'm working on, a saloon, which, if I do it right, should have some cool animation in it. This was actually suggested in the live stream I did with Patreon. Somebody suggested I should make the the doors kind of creak and swing open. I'm like, ooh, that's actually a better idea than what I had. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna do that. So I'm working on that, solving those problems, and uh, that's gonna be pretty cool. The other structures are probably gonna end up being mock-ups for now, but you know, I'm pretty good with mock-ups, so they'll be fully printed and stuff, so they'll look good. And then the lighting and the trains, and it'll be nice. It'll be nice for Halloween. It'll be nice and spooky. And that gives me a new deadline to actually finish the thing uh, to the point where I want to travel with it. And that will be for um, the, uh, the, the uh, ON30 Fiesta at Gary Beatty's place in Riverside, which is tentatively planned for May. So I'd like to get, so it gives me a little bit more time to get a lot more of it done between now and May. And I want to work on other stuff too. Just working on the, the gruesome gulch all this time. I mean, I love Halloween, but there are a lot of other projects that have had uh, go into the back burner. Otter Creek and Rio Grande. You hit a deadline today. It feels good to get finished with a project in time or before yourself, but it does feel good. And I usually like to hit deadlines. That's why I, you know, I give my self deadlines for two reasons. It's just like a checklist, right? I mean, I, I'm one of those people that I like checklists so much that I will write stuff on the checklist that I've already finished just so I can check it off. <laughs> it's like, ooh, I'm very accomplished. But um, uh, yeah, you know, so you set a deadline and you get it done. It's a great feeling of accomplishment. And, you know, you let yourself down a little bit. I, 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 I it was never really a hard and fast. It was more of a goal. They're more like guidelines, really, as Captain Barbosa would say, uh, than, <laughs> than a deadline. Uh, it's not like anybody was paying me to do it. So I'm pretty, I'm a pretty good boss for myself to work for. I, I, I you know, you got to cut yourself a break too sometimes and say, yeah, it's just, it's too much. But it, that said, it'll still be spectacular on the 29th. Um, some people have asked if I'm going to do a live stream on the 29th, uh, for, for, uh, Halloween. And if I can figure out where to put the camera, uh, I will. And I'll keep you, I'll keep everybody posted on that. You will have an international visitor. Are you, are you coming? Wow. No, no pressure. Now I've got people coming from. 
you know, across the ocean. They're trying to reach me about my car's extended warranty. Uh, I write a project deadline. Uh, Zane says, I write a project deadline on a sticky note and uh, put it on the wall behind my computer monitor. Yeah, I do that too. I actually have sticky notes everywhere all over my computer monitor. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I like these little, um, little notebooks. I carry them around and I make lists in those little, little check boxes and, and uh, that's my it, wow you are coming out again wow that'll be great be great to meet you in person i'm really looking forward to it what got put on the back burner turntable rat house something yeah everything uh the uh mainly the big thunder mine which i was chugging along on uh before i started on the gruesome gulch project uh i was going to build the um the hoist house and i have all the stuff to build the hoist house with the animated hoist and everything that's the main thing that got pushed back. That's that's the project that's uh, that's uh, sitting. My sound cut out. Can you hear me? Oh, my sound cut out when the phone was ringing, probably. Can you hear me now? Check one, two. My audio is, thank you, Jim. My audio is working. Well, that's another lovely benefit of uh, people spamming me while I'm doing this, is that it cuts the sound out of my, <laughs> my microphone. Anyway, back to tool time. I feel like Tim, the tool man. Uh, uh, so we talked about one, two, three blocks, which if you don't have a set of these, you should pick them up. I think I got these from Harbor Freight. They were not expensive. Uh, and you can pay a lot. And the difference between a, a, a relatively inexpensive set of one, two, three blocks and a very expensive set is the level of precision machining on them. But for what we do in the model railroad hobby uh, with model structures and stuff like that, the cheap ones are just fine. Uh, we're not we're not building spaceships here to go to uh, to the moon. Um, the next tool is probably one I am asked about the most. People see me using this in videos, and so I want to talk a little bit about it. And that's my little mini miter box, which comes, well, it mates with this little uh, razor saw. And this razor saw has a replaceable blades. This one is broken, as you can see. They do break. But the nice thing is you can continue to use them even after they break. And you can get these uh, these handles and these little miter boxes, and it's uh, it's got uh, 90 degrees, uh, 45 degrees, and 60 degree angle built in. Uh, you can pick these up from uh, Micromark and the blades too. And the blades are made by MK, well, CMK resin kits. And you can get them, some of them have a different number of teeth on one side or the other. This one is fine on both sides. You can get them with fine, a little coarse for faster cuts, depending on what you're cutting. Um, great for styrene and wood. So, love this thing. I use it. I mean, what I basically got out here today uh, to show you guys for show and tell is the um, the tools I use every day on every single project. So, the one, two, three blocks. These guys I use every day. Yeah. Really handy. Yeah, I, they used to sell all of these pieces. They do. They still st still sell them all separately uh, over on Micromark. But I think recently they've put them all together in a set that you can pick up, and uh, which is nice. Um, you can pick all those up together and uh, get some extra replacement blades. Speaking of cutting stuff, got to have one of these, right? This is a what is this Exacto? Yeah. A uh, handle. I've got probably four or five of these, um, and uh, lots and lots of spare blades. Uh, if I could give you one piece of advice, it's change your blade, <laughs> change it, change it early and often. So I buy blades in bulk, and uh, as soon as that tip breaks off, they're still good for some things after that. But 
the tip always breaks off. It's time to change them after that. Um, more cutting stuff. Scissors. Uh, if you only have one pair of scissors, you need to get another pair of scissors. And the reason for that is scissors are used for everything, right? Uh, we're using these all the time. We're cutting through uh, tape and uh, all kinds of different materials in this hobby, wood, all kinds of stuff. So you need to have two pairs of scissors, uh, a sharp pair, and a dull pair. I mean, the dull pair shouldn't be dull, but uh, these are these are junk scissors that I've had for 20 years, and these are fabric shears, which are really nice and sharp, and they shouldn't be used to cut anything other than fabric. You shouldn't use the same scissors to cut fabric as you use to cut paper and tape and everything else. So, yeah, word of the wise, get yourself two pairs of scissors, and if you're really anal about it, like I am, Three pairs of scissors. These are I use uh, for shingling roofs all the time. You'll see me when I'm doing the shingles, the shingle strips. These are really handy for uh, for that. They get into tighter places than the big scissors will get into. This uh, this video is is out going out to the public, Jim. This is everybody. Ah, yeah, scrap mold. Mm-hmm. Detail scissors, yes. The back end of the knife, not the sharp end, is excellent in cutting screws off. That's true. Or you could get yourself uh, some sprue nippers, which I don't have here, by the way. But I do have these. Uh, these are some flush cutting pliers, which are made by Zeron. I really like these. These are like my favorite flush cutting pliers. In fact, I've used them so much that I need to get a new pair. Um, these were sh sold as rail nippers, but they're actually just regular, they're flush cutting pliers. You can use them if you want to cut anything flush. And the way they work is they have this V slot on this side and they're perfectly flat on that side. So when you cut something, what can I cut? I don't have any rail here handy, but, uh, yeah, it cuts them nice and straight. Now what you shouldn't do with flush cutting nippers is what I did and use them to cut, um, music wire. <laughs> <laughs> because if you look really close, there's a, see, there's a hole. They don't quite come together anymore. So, uh, yeah, don't use them to cut anything like hardened steel because that will ruin them. So I need a new pair of those. But, again, this is a tool that I use constantly. Um, I'm sorry I don't speak uh, that good of Spanish, so I can't translate that. Cut the wood music wire. Everyone's done that. Everyone's done that. Because what do you else? I mean, if you use your needle nose pliers, it's going to do the same thing. You need to get some really heavy duty uh, wire cutters for for uh, music wire. Oh, I almost forgot. The other thing that pairs nicely with the uh, one, two, three blocks is a machinist square. Again, you can spend a lot of money, or you can spend a little money. And the less expensive ones uh, work great for um, building uh, kits and models and stuff like that. This is a pin vise. Again, this is a tool I use constantly. And you need a set of um, mini twist drill bits to go with this. And this set, let me. Uh, Put my eyeballs on here so I can see. This set goes from uh, 135 thou to 38. No, 39. And that's a size 80 to 61. And that's going to cover pretty much all of your hobby needs. And you might notice there's a bunch of them missing because uh, one day I dumped this over in the rug and I couldn't ever find them all again. And then some of them broke. And so uh, kind of like the pliers, I need a new set of <laughs> drill bits, too. you got to replace these after a while. They get dull after a while, anyway. So that's a handy thing. Um, yeah, I, I use this, this all the time when, uh, when building stuff. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. Guitar E string cut easily with small cutters. Music wire laps. Yeah, it's hardened. They're hardened steel. Yeah, that's it's like trying to cut a you know a sword. It's yeah, not good. Um clamps. This is another thing I'm always asked about is these these cool little clamps. I got these from Micromark. These nice little soft jawed uh clamps. And I use these all the time when uh, when building stuff. Um just got to make sure you clean them because they get gunk built up in here, glue and stuff like that. Uh, and if you don't want to spend the money on these, or even if you do, um, go down to uh, Walmart or wherever and pick up a bag of clothespins for, you know, three bucks. Because <laughs> these are great clamps for model building. You, you guys all know this stuff. You know this stuff, right? And you can take a clothespin and flip the sides around, turn it inside out, and it makes a much more precision grabber. And I use this for uh, holding on to small details and things like that while I'm painting them. Like that. So basically, you take the wooden parts off, flip it around, and you end up with that. Let's see. What else we got? Forceps? Nurse? Forceps. Got to have a pair of these. Um, these are also filthy. <laughs> Just look at all my tools are really dirty. <laughs> I need to clean the gunk off of these. Um, very handy. In fact, you should have a whole set of uh, nice uh, tweezers if you don't. Um, measuring. Now, fortunately, I work in O scale which is a quarter inch to a foot. So I really don't need a scale ruler. Uh, this regular old metal ruler, which is my favorite one to use because it's just the right size for model building. It's, it's a foot long and uh, an inch wide. Um, got cork on the back so it doesn't slide around. A nice metal ruler like this is a fantastic to have uh, if you don't have one. Um, forget about plastic rulers. These are nice. These are scale rulers. This is from uh, who is these? CTT Incorporated. You used to be able to get these from Walther's and your local uh, uh, your local hobby shops. Um, probably still available from them or the NMRA. Uh, this is a HO scale ruler, one eighty seven. These are nice because they're clear. Uh, I like the fact that they're clear. I don't like the fact that they're plastic. Because, as you know, if you've ever tried to cut anything with a plastic ruler, you're gonna you're gonna dig into the ruler. Got another one here. This is N scale, one one sixtieth. If I have any N scale fans out there, yes, I still own an N scale ruler, though I never use it. So, measuring, cutting, you know, basically what we're doing is we're making big stuff into smaller stuff. That's you know that's what we do. So what creatures are populating the gruesome gulch? Well, I've showed you some of those before. We'll, we'll get to that. Let me finish up with the tools, Robert. Speaking of N-scale, guys. Hi, Robert. I got my N-scale ruler. <laughs> um, let me finish up with the tools, and then we'll talk about that. Um, this thing is really handy. If you don't have one of these, uh, great for uh, wiring. This is, a, a, uh, this is made by, called No Easy. FS D3, and it's a self adjusting uh, nipper for wires that takes the, uh, the insulation, off, insulation remover. So you don't have to go and find the, you know, match it up with the gauge of the wire uh, to the cutter. This does that automatically. It also has just a regular cutter down here. You can just snip that out, piece off clean like that. And then this red bar adjusts back and forth so you can uh, adjust the length of uh, insulation that you want to take off and then you just put it in here and presto of course it didn't work <laughs> there we go usually it just comes right up so this is a, these, these are really handy um, maybe mine's getting dull I don't know um, 
Another thing I'm asked about all the time is uh, uh, cyanoacrylate um, and how to dispense it. So now we've, we've, we've cut, we've shaped, we've wired, and we're gluing things together. Uh, I, I buy CA in these bottles about this size. What is this? Uh, two ounces, these two ounce bottles, um, 56.8 grams. And uh, I dispense it with these. You can buy a bag of, you know, a hundred of these for very little. These uh, tips, these replaceable tips, they just fit right down over the top. And what happens is the uh, the glue will actually dry up in the end and make a little ball. So it's a self-sealing thing. And then you can just take your hobby knife and cut the end off and you're ready to apply more glue. So that is a handy thing to have. Where do I get them? These? I think I got these on Amazon. I can't do it right now, but uh, once this video is, uh, the, the live is done, I can put a link down below. Um, I should link to these on my website, on the handy links page. <laughs> but yeah, these are, um, I don't even know what they're called. Glue tips. Probably what I searched for uh, CA to find them. Oh, also with CA, uh, I've talked about this stuff before. Uh, it's a good idea to have a, an accelerant, a kicker. This stuff is mostly um, acetone, so don't spend a lot of time breathing it. Uh, but what it does is it helps the CA uh, dry much more quickly, or not dry, but you know, uh, set up and evaporate. This also works great too, baking soda. And sometimes you can just blow on it, and that will help it set up more quickly. Any questions? <laughs> let's see, let's see, uh, I don't know if you guys have been asking questions. I haven't been able to keep up. What rolling stock are you going to run on the Gruesome Gulch? Um, I did a video. I did a couple of uh, coaches. It's They're, they're, uh, they're like excursion coaches. I did a video on that um, that I modified some HO scale uh, roundhouse 36 foot uh, shorty coaches into ON30 excursion cars. And I built two of those. I had intended to build four of those. I probably will still build four of those at some point, but there's two of them for now. And uh, yeah, I'm going to modify the Porter with uh, a new cab and uh, some other details on it too to uh, make it a little more spooky. And the driver is going to be a skeleton. Oh, soldering iron. Uh, you know, I was going to talk about soldering iron, but I hate all soldering irons. So, <laughs> so this is supposed to be about tools that I like. I've never found one that I really, I was like, oh, this is a great soldering iron. And, you know, and, and that's, be, and it's my own fault. It's operator error. You, you got to keep them clean. You know, you got to keep the tip clean. Or they don't generate good heat, and I'm really lazy about that. Uh, the one I what do I do with it? I don't even know where it is now. I had one right there that I was going to show you, but it, it wandered off. So yeah, what do you guys recommend? What's your favorite soldering? I'm going to turn this around on you. What's your favorite soldering iron? And you know, I'll look and go, hey, that one looks pretty good, and I'll go get it. Um, the tip about the tips. You're welcome. Let's see. All the best on 30 guys do end scale. Well, Daniel, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I mean, they might have started in end scale when they were young and foolish and inexperienced, and then they move on. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get in trouble for that. Let's see. Hunter for eight bucks. There you go. CA glue applicator tips. Thank you, Daniel. You guys are very helpful. What camera do I use? Right now, I'm using my uh, my iPhone. Uh, I've I've talked about this before. I've experimented with other with other cameras. I bought a Sony Z100. It was a really nice camera. It was not cheap, and uh, I hated it. Uh, I did it. For, I used it for a couple of videos, and what it did is it made me look good, but it made the the 
it, it was really bad at focusing on small things on the workbench. And uh, it's kind of what I need it for. And my iPhone is great for that. So, I mean, it's not, it's not 4K. I mean, if we're keeping track, but it's, uh, it does, it does fine. I mean, what do you guys think of the video quality? It's usually, they, they look pretty good, right? I hope. <laughs> Three cents a tip. There you go. One that works. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> one that works. Uh, the camera I use is one that works, and I don't have to spend too much time uh, figuring out or working out. Uh, let's see. What else we got? You can use a cordless temp control iron. Who makes it? Yeah, most of the time I use my Weller soldering gun, which is, you know, it's a, it's a piece of junk. It's the one you can get at any hardware store. But uh, it works. Buy years of fries about 10 years. Yeah, I just keep buying new tips for them. One thing I did, thank you, the video looks good. That's why I like to hear. Uh, one thing I did uh, on the Gruesome Gulch, if you go back and watch, was it the second video, or I was laying track, is I used a torch. I used a, a, a butane torch to solder the track. And I really liked that. It worked great. Because what you need to solder track, because you know, you're know you working with a denser metal here, you're not just doing wires. Um, is you need a lot of hot heat. Yeah, you need a lot of heat fast. So I, the torch worked fantastic. Uh, I really like that. Unfortunately, it it melts everything else. <laughs> it lights everything on fire all around it. And you can you you can put a soldering uh, tip on it too, and not not use the open flame like I did. It even comes with a soldering tip. And the idea is you you turn the torch on. <laughs> Get it nice and hot and then turn it off and you can use that soldering tip. But uh, I found I didn't give that instant blast of heat that I really needed to solder the rails and they are solid. It's like they're it's like well they're welded. They're they're one piece of rail now. So oh uh, let's see. It's the content. Okay, the videos suck, but the content is spectacular. <laughs> the quality is terrible. <laughs> Are you a Disney enthusiast or did you also work there? Here's the thing. Um, no. All my friends worked there. So they got me in for free. This was back in the 70s, way before a lot of you guys were born. And uh, so when we were in school, you know, everyone got summer jobs at Disneyland because it was right up the road. I was a long haired hippie freak, you know, playing in a band and I had a mustache and long hair and everything. And so they wouldn't have hired me. And I wasn't, you know, I was too cool to shave. So I wasn't, uh, but I was always kind of envious of my friends that worked at Disneyland. Um, I knew a girl, she was, uh, she was Snow White. I had friends who were in the parades. I had friends who were, uh, worked the attractions. So, you know, back in those days, they, you know, they could sign in and it was fun. So that's where my you know, I grew up down the street, and then that's where my love for it all started out. This would have been 78, 79, 80, right in there. Love your old Weller soldering station. You change the tip to change the temperature, right? Jim, Jim is an electronics guy, so let me see what he says. He used an Xtronic Model 3020 adjustable temperature soldering iron. Okay. Is that a good one? <laughs> Disney is not the same company there anymore. Yeah, I, I agree. Soldering irons are better than guns, but slower, right? Is there a difference between code 83 and code 100 track? That's a good question. Uh, yes, it's the size of the rail. Um, Somebody else smarter than me can probably answer this better as far as what they represent at scale, depending on what scale you're in. Uh, code 83 is much more accurate for like HO scale. It's probably more accurate for ON32. 
uh, as far as the weight of the rail is concerned. Um, <clears throat> Code 100 is a little bigger. Code 100 is your standard Atlas snap track. Uh, your Bachman train set track is, is Code 100. Uh, the Pico ON30 track that I use on the Thunder Mesa layout is also Code 100. Visually, though, once they're painted and ballasted, it's really hard to tell the difference. Uh, I used a, a Micro Engineering Code 83 on the uh, Gruesome Gulch layout. And once the track's all painted and ballasted, yeah, it all. <laughs> if you do a good job painting and ballasting and all that stuff, they, they look they look fine. Uh, the Code 100 track is, um, of course, it takes longer to solder because it's a little denser. Code 83 track. Once you get smaller, once you get down below Code 70 and Code, you know, Code 53, and down those really small sizes, the rail uh, it is gets harder and harder to work with. Because it's just so thin, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's really easy to uh, uh, to uh, bend it in a shape you don't want it to be in. Resistant soldering is the best, says Gerald. Ah, uh, that's what I've heard. I have yet to try that. It's the the resistant solder, resistance soldering uh, irons are not cheap. Um, let's see. As the sign said, long-haired freaking people need to plow it not apply it. That's true. That's exactly. Back in those days, back in the olden times, kids, you couldn't get a job at Disneyland if you had facial hair or if you had hair below, uh, down to your collar, which I did. So um, they wouldn't hire you. Youngster. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I got carded the other day. I was buying a six-pack of beer. <laughs> and the guy says, can I see your ID? And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> no one has said that to me in, you know, 40 years. Um, but he had to, he, what, what it was, it, and, and I was like all flattered, like, oh, wow, I must look really young. But what it turned out was uh, um, they have to input your birth date into the cash register. <laughs> It, it you know in order to be able to sell you the beer so it just make something up man <laughs> you can't possibly think I'm under twenty one um, T Crash Projections asks this is a great question do you have that engine AKA a basket case engine that seems to never want to operate well if so which one is it uh, yes. Um, I'll be right back. I'll get it for you. Hold on. Oh. Lo and behold, it is a Bachman Porter. It's a uh, Porter number nine. Uh, the, uh, the Admiral Fowler, which is ironic because Admiral Fowler uh, was the general manager of Disneyland and always oversaw the construction, and he worked very well. <laughs> this one, I can't get it to run. Um, I suspect it probably needs a whole new decoder. I just haven't uh, carved out the time or the uh, intestinal fortitude to take it apart and, and speaking of soldering, replace the decoder in it uh it's uh yeah it just it's it hesitates it sells the bachman decoders are crap by the way anyway just let's get that out of the way <laughs> sometimes they work sometimes they're eh, you know uh this one uh worked for a while and then i was running it in a consist with another porter i was double hitting with the porter and uh, when I took the con broke the consist down using DCC, you you know you break consist, erase, blah blah blah. Uh, the one locomotive went along its merry way like it was supposed to, and this one has never worked right again. Um, and I've tried to reset all the CVs. Those of you who know uh, DCC stuff, reset it back to factory uh, on a programming track. Nothing. So it needs a new decoder, I think. So this one is a basket case. Looks good. 
Uh, this is a new cab that I made for it, which I haven't painted yet, but um, it doesn't it doesn't run, which is why you never see it running in any of the videos, because <laughs> it doesn't move. Let's see. That's a good question. <laughs> the YouTube stats for average age for Thunder Mesa. I could tell you, <clears throat> it's uh, it's uh, well over forty five. And, uh, you know, male. Big surprise there, right? That's the hobby. Um, right. That, well, thank you, Gerald. Yeah, code 100 is one one hundred of an inch tall, and code 83 is uh, 0 0.083 inches tall. Yes. That's the technical, the, the, the technical measurements. Um, what does that represent now? in say o scale but what what pound rate i used to know this stuff i had it written down and i just don't use the information enough to remember it on the other side of my question what is your which of them is your favorite that's a good a good follow-up what's my favorite locomotive to operate is uh locomotive number eight which is the stearns heisler bomb proof love that thing runs like a champ 99% of the time, if you come to one of the open studios, it's going to be running because it's my favorite one to operate. Great locomotive. Another one I really like is also a Bachman Porter. Um, it's uh, number three, which was uh, formerly owned by Vern Niner, uh, which is one of my favorite ones to operate. Sound, sound equipped uh, Bachman Porter with uh, Keep Alive and all that stuff that uh, he totally did a wonderful job uh, fixing for me. Or fixing for himself, and then I got to benefit from the locomotive. <laughs> Graduated high school in 1965. Well, Jeff, you're an old dude. You make me feel young. Thank you. They had high school in 1965. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, CV8, yeah. CV8. Reset to factory defaults. Didn't work. What kind of laser cutter do I use? Uh, well, that's another one. I've, that's another question I'm asked all the time. And I, you know, if I could have brought it here, it's the size of a washing machine. I would have brought it here. It's a uh, Flux Beambox Pro. Is the laser cutter that I use? It has a built-in uh, cooling and a lovely built-in camera. Very nice uh, machine that I have zero complaints about, which is. You know, but it's about the best thing you can say about any tool. It's it's fantastic. Do you airbrush anything, Randy? Hi, Randy. I uh, would like to know. If so, what do you use? Yes, I do airbrush. And my favorite uh, workhorse airbrush is a Pash uh, Double Action. Which What's the number on this? Well, it's a Pash Double Action. Um, I've used the Wadas, I've used Badgers, I've used Binks. Um, I, you know, I used to do illustration back in the days before um, there was computers. <laughs> I know I'm not as old as you, but back in those days, you had to learn how to use an airbrush. And um, I like a double action airbrush because you can control both the airflow and the paint flow at the same time by pulling back and pushing down on the button. This is uh, my favorite airbrush to use. Um, there are a lot of great ones out there. Awada makes uh, some of the best uh, out there. All of that said, you don't see me airbrushing very often because I hate cleaning my airbrush. Um, just not, not fun. And you always have to clean it. It's it's a pain in the butt. I mean, especially if you're you're using, uh, if you actually if you're spraying lacquer based paints, it's easy. You just run a little lacquer thinner through there. The worst thing for your airbrush is acrylic paint, which all model paints practically are now, and um, you know, it's liquid plastic, and it makes a mess, and you have to you have to clean it out. They make airbrush thinners that's for for acrylics that work pretty well. But you go through a lot of it because you have to spray it through the brush to get it clean. And you don't want to be breathing that stuff either. Heath, what's your question? What is it? 
Go back. What is it? Any tools that you had to buy? Okay, and see, now it jumped. Now I can't see it. <laughs> Have I tried cutting sheet styrene on the laser cutter? No, but I've cut acrylic. Cuts acrylic like a dream. Oh, any tools that you had to buy but you never used? Another excellent question. Yes, you guys are on fire tonight. That's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, when we were doing the uh, the Waltz Barn kit in O scale, and we were prototyping it, we had to come up with a way to do the weather vane in O scale. And the best way to do the weather vane in O scale, if you, you could laser cut it. Um, I mean, if we're going to do it again, if we're going to run more of them, we'd probably 3D print it. But we did it as a, a, a photo etched uh, nickel. So I uh, bought an entire photo etching uh, setup kit. And I've never used it since. <laughs> because photo etching is... You know, I was just talking about cleaning airbrushes is a pain in the butt. Oh, my God. Photo etching is, it's you have to be actually in, in, in almost like laboratory clean room conditions in order f to get good results. Um, it's a multi-step process, um, you know, and you don't find out until the end after you've spent half a day or more working on it if you get anything that's usable out of it. Um, there's a steep learning curve. I learned how to do it, and it's not a lot of fun. I don't recommend it unless you really, you know, it's right up there with uh, uh, mold making in my... <laughs> Some people enjoy it. That's great. Some people like doing photo etching. We found a guy, actually, who loves doing photo etching, and once I had prototyped it, we had him do the production, and they were beautiful. Because he has all the, you know, he had the laboratory clean room environment to, to do it in. And they came out fantastic. But, yeah. I have a whole photo etching setup which sits in a shelf in the storage closet back here and hasn't been out since. Your first, uh, Dale says, his first airbrush was a badger with a can of propellant. Yeah. 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 It's a... Uh, you didn't like it. <laughs> when is the next run of the Disney Barn in Osco? Robert, ask Jake. Uh, Clyde would like to know, what is my regular job in real life? Well, uh, I'm primarily a graphic artist, but I do a lot of things. In fact, I've recently uh, taken on the role uh, of uh, media creation and production for an outdoor company that my wife is involved with. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. So I'm producing videos and things for them. So that's that's kind of fun. Uh, yeah. But for, for many years, I did illustration and graphic design. I don't take on new clients anymore because I don't want to. <laughs> Heath, ask me again. Didn't I answer your question, Heath? Uh, are there any commercial instances in in 18 No. Uh, they're all, you've got to scratch build something or you've got to do a conversion. Uh, there's um, Railway Recollections. You can find him, his stuff on uh, Facebook and you can find his stuff on eBay. He makes nice resin kits for converting N-scale engines to ON18. Uh, that's a good, it's a good source. There's also a few uh, that you can find on, on Shapeways, 3D printed superstructures and stuff that you can make with uh, N-scale um, uh, running gear and, and chassis and stuff like that. But you got to find a donor. <clears throat> Hi, Gary. Thank you. Just stopping by to say you love what I'm doing with Gruesome Gulch. Good, because I, I told these guys earlier that uh, the new deadline... <laughs> 
because it's not going to be done by Halloween surprise surprise is uh, is going to be uh, your shindig so I have till May now okay so I answered that any tools I ever buy I have to use um, Do I have any drawings or sketches of the possible haunted mansion, the Ravenswood Manor? Yes, but I'm not going to show them to you now. <laughs> They're not here. They're on my computer at home. This is a Port of Baracho Railway. It's not Gary. Gary Beatty. This is uh, this is uh, uh, Wild Eye Willie and uh, what's the other guy's name? Let's see. Yes, photo etching is almost a hobby in itself. We had a discussion about that on another live stream, talking about I don't need another hobby. You know, I don't need a, like photography or <laughs> photo etching, which is yeah, it's a it's it's very involved. <clears throat> Have I checked out many prints? Yes, and that helps me circle around to an earlier question from my friend Robert. What kind of creatures uh, are we going to have on the Gruesome Gulch? Not a lot. I'm not really into zombies and witches. I don't want it to be too Halloween-y. I want it to be more classically like Haunted Mansion, you know, so skeletons and ghosts and things like that. I think I showed you this before. Uh, obviously, I've got some ravens that I put on there and some uh, um, buzzards, some tricky buzzards. But this is pretty cool. This is the Headless Horseman from uh, Ichabod Crane. And he comes with a pumpkin. This is from Mini Prince. And this is, gives you a good idea of the quality. Let me just get this up there where you guys can see it. This is a beautiful print. Miniprints.com. Highly recommend them. Um, what else we got? Got more pumpkins. Got some jack-o'-lanterns. What I want to have is, uh, you know, I did the station, and, uh, you know, all of the plants around Grissom Gulch are dead. It's just dead weeds and stuff. But I want to have, a like, a pumpkin vine growing up through the platform of the station with uh, pumpkins growing there. That is kind of Halloween-y, is it? Got some bats. Got a bag of bats, and these will go back in the bat cave in the, uh, the underground lair. Uh, I've got some skeletons. One of these, which I've already painted, is going to be the engineer uh, on the uh, the porter for the Grissom Gulch Railroad. It goes around. A couple more skeletons. Got to be really careful with these. They're very fragile. I've already popped one of their heads off. You can glue it back on. Got some coffins. I'm using those. What else do I got? Is that all? Well, that's all I've got right now. I need to order some more stuff. And then I've got some, some figures from Knuckle Duster that I'll be painting up to look like ghosts, very similar to the way the Haunted Mansion uh, figures are painted. So, Kind of like I did for the, the in the station with the Gustav Grusom. So that's the stuff I've got for mini print. Highly recommend it. <clears throat> Hi, Mike. I'm glad some of you are giving me or telling me, you know, you've got your aliases here on YouTube. And man, I don't blame you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, tell me your real name. So, you know, if I know you from other social media, I can give you a shout out and say hi. Mike Miller. Hi. Uh, let's see. May 6th. Not, not Cinco de Mayo. Have I tried 3D printing? Um, you know, we've talked about this before. Uh, <clears throat> no. <laughs> Something I might get into in the future uh, if I if I want to uh, a whole other hobby. Uh, I've got a good friend who does some beautiful uh, 3D printing. He's got a really nice form lab. It's a resin printer and does some stuff. Uh, does some great stuff. So it's kind of like, you know, you want to buy a boat? No, I've got a friend that's got a boat. It's even better. Uh, 
Let's see. I'm way behind. Ghosts are really people. Norman says, ghosts are really people that died trying to fold a fitted sheet. <laughs> that is the dad joke of the night. I love it. I could go home and tell my wife that. Heath, did I answer your question? I'm giving you a chance to ask it again if I didn't ask it, if I didn't answer. HON30, conversion for mini prints, yeah. Have I thought about getting my own 3D printer? I think I just answered that. I have a friend that's got a very nice 3D printer. Thank you, Jeff. Did Mongo make it to Thunder Mesa? Um, no. Mongo, only pawn in Game of Life. <laughs> Mongo is uh, waiting to get painted back here. See, these are all the projects that got put on the back burner when I started Gruesome Gulch. He's sitting over there. I, I got he needs a, he needs a paint job. Yeah, they do some great. Uh, Lynn, you're correct. Uh, mini prints, uh, fa fantastic. Some of the best I've ever seen. Antlers and cow skulls and elk skulls. Um, like if you want to decorate a western building or something, old saloon, put a, put a, uh, some antlers up there or the <clears throat> front of a uh, locomotive. Really nice stuff. This may sound strange, but I've been experimenting and found DNP RPG figures are almost perfectly scaled. Uh, <clears> oh, <throat> and 30 engines of rolling stock. Um, yes, other people have found that too. What are they? What are their size? I have some. Um, where are they? Gaming figures. Yeah, here, let me give you a couple of examples. Of what works and what doesn't. Um, this guy is from Knuckle Duster. He's a gaming figure. He's not a model railroad figure. And he is... Let's see. Yeah, 20, 23 milliliter, mil, milliliters, <laughs> 23 millimeters, 23 millimeters. And this guy is, oh wait, this is a scale ruler. He's 23 scale feet tall in N scale. <laughs> it's been a long day, <laughs> I'm tired. Let me try this again. Oh, I knew that was wrong. Yes. 40. That's the that was the number. 40 millimeter scale gaming figures work pretty well in O scale. They're just a little they're a little big because let's see. He would be Yeah, he's yeah, he's right he's six feet tall. So 40 millimeter. Whereas these guys this little guy is a, let's see, and 20, 32 millimeter. He's a little short. So the 30, these guys are too small, but the 40 millimeter figures are uh, just about right for uh, O scale. And especially, you know, we talked about <clears throat> one of these live streams doing a, uh, like a fan fantasy themed railroad. You get the fantasy gaming figures and 40 millimeter, and uh, they're, they're fantastic. You're about to make a boat joke. Yep. Your name is Inigo Montoya. Hello. <laughs> I love that movie. Hi, Patrick. Howdy, folks. I know you're Heath. What, did I, what was the question, Heath? Did I, I answered it? Okay, good. You found 3D printing as a whole another hobby. Yeah. <laughs> the boat in it, yeah. Let's see. <laughs> Trent 
Tracy says fitted sheets are easy to fold if you know how. I have never found them. You know, no matter how I try, it's just a wad. I've tried and I just hide it in the back of the cupboard behind the flat sheet. 28 millimeter. Thank you. See, I know there's a standard. They, they vary, but yes. What did I say? 30? Yeah, 28. 28 millimeter are too small for uh, a scale. Yeah, they're twice slightly bigger. 40 millimeter and 35. 35 would work. It'd be kind of a short guy, but yeah. <laughs> Either too much coffee or not enough. And I know I'm. I feel like I'm babbling. Bottom of the feet to the eye, really, not to the top of the head. Okay. See, that's a weird way to scale things, but that's the gaming uh, tabletop gaming. Um. <laughs> oh, you have a whole army of orcs that could destroy someone's railroad. Oh, the the tool. Okay, you you were that he you were asking about the t the 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 tool I bought and never used. Yeah, the uh, I, now I don't want to put anybody off from doing, but I feel like I probably have from doing uh, um, photo etched stuff. It's a fascinating process, and you can get a level of detail doing it that you can't get at scale any other way. Uh, I've seen some amazing scale tools made that way um, wrought iron railings and things like that uh, weather vanes etc um, even laser cutting because you know you can't the curve on the laser gets to the point where you know you try to cut anything that small it just you know just burns away to nothing even on a really nice high-end laser it still it doesn't Heath wants to know what is the uh, very very important question. What is the proper footwear for working on your model railroad? Uh, I'm often wearing flip flops. <laughs> but that's just me. Let's see. I started a little late, so it'll go a little longer. But steel cap boots. I got a pair of those too, which I don't always wear. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, most uh, wargaming figures uh, have headgear, helmets, hats, things like that. So the measurement is to the eye level. That, that makes perfect sense. Uh, Flip-flops, that seems OSHA safe. No, but, you know, it's just me. It's just me in here. I'm the only one that has to worry about it. And yes, if you've ever had one of these roll off your table. <laughs> they land blade down in the floor and and quiver. You know, it's like a, it's like a knife throw in a movie. I've missed my feet a couple of times. Well, more than a couple. You find out how quick your reflexes are <laughs> when this thing rolls off the edge of the table and <clears throat> heads for your feet. Yeah, that would hurt. Running shoes so you can go fast, right, Jason? Yes, let's ask a real expert. Don't ask me. Jason, what do you wear? You wear running shoes. That's good. So did I miss anybody else's questions? Anybody else got it? Because this is, this is kind of like last call. If I did, you guys probably got disgusted and left. Our, oh, this is a good one. Um, Dennis, are 40 millimeter structures correct for ON30? Uh, I would have to get one and measure. You know, a lot of the, the <clears throat> war gaming stuff and the tabletop gaming stuff is not really precise uh, at, to scale at the level that uh, model train stuff is. I don't want to get in trouble with uh, war gaming people, but it's not. It's not as precise. It tends to be kind of chunky, a lot chunkier. Um, so I would have to get, a, if, if I don't have any of those uh, buildings here to measure, but um, I, would, I would find a door and measure it. And if it's uh, a scale 80 inches tall, 
then sure. Zane says he was considering building my own model railroad, but a he bought a Honda motorcycle instead. I said, I, I hope you get a lot of good use of it and be safe out there. Wear a helmet. Let's see. Anything else? Yes, running shoes so you can go fast. <laughs> yeah, mumbly peg with the uh, the, the falling exacto knife. Are my railroad logos water slide or dry transfer water slide decals? Um, I do them either one of two ways, usually. I've looked into dry transfers, and you can get custom dry transfers made, but it's not cheap. Um, uh, I do them with the, the printed paper technique, like I use on some rolling stock and structures you may have seen. Uh, and then I, d I do use water slide decals uh, also that I had custom made by the late Stan Cedarleaf, who's sadly no longer with us. So if I'm going to get more made, I have to find a new source. Dave Van is here. Hi, Dave. Your ISP is so bad you can't watch. I'm sorry. I hope you can catch it on the rerun. <laughs> you mean to say that Warhammer figures won't look right on my 1930s steam era short line railroad? Your railroad, your rules. Bye, Norman. Thanks for tuning in, man. Well, okay. I think we're all caught up. Unless anybody else has anything. Um, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I want to thank you for being subscribers here on YouTube. And, uh, you know, as we say here in Jerome, don't let the door hit you with a good... <laughs> <laughs> trying out a new sign off no. <laughs> oh thanks for uh thanks for sticking with me through that technical difficulty at the front end uh, hopefully we'll get that ironed out before the next uh, live stream which will likely be the third wednesday in november uh, i want to remind everybody before i go that uh, the next uh open studio is 10 days away it's uh, saturday the 29th it's an evening open studio we're doing it 4 30 to 7 30 so we can have <clears throat> both layouts in night mode all the lights lit up and the moonlight and the spooky sounds and uh, wolves howling off in the distance and all that great stuff. So that's going to be fun. That'll be uh, on um, Halloween weekend on the 29th. And uh, I'm not going to have an open studio at all in November. I'm going to take a week off at the beginning of November. And uh, other than that, uh, I got some uh, more content coming real soon. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great evening. Keep moving forward. And uh, adios for now.